Mitigation is the process of reducing the impact of a security event or a potential security event. And in this video, we'll look at some of these mitigation techniques. One great way to stop an attack is well before the attack even happens. And the best way to do this is by patching any known vulnerabilities. This will not only keep your system more secure, but occasionally it will also keep your system more stable. Organizations like Microsoft create a series of patches every month that you can then push out to keep all of your systems up to date with the latest security patches. You might also get security patches from application developers or device manufacturers to make sure that those devices are also secured. And you may find that your operating systems at home patch themselves automatically. It's built into the operating system to constantly check to see if new patches are available. And if they are, it will download them and install them without any type of user intervention. In a large organization, however, this might not be an automated process. Instead, the information technology department may test the patches first, and only once they know that they're working properly do they push them out to everybody else's system. And although some of these patches arrive on regular intervals, there may be times when an emergency patch is pushed out, especially if it's a significant vulnerability and the attackers are actively taking advantage of this unpatched opening. Another way to mitigate these security events is to limit how much data an attacker could get their hands on. Many file systems include encryption as part of the file system itself. It's integrated into the operating system. So you can select the file or the folder and have the operating system only encrypt that specific piece of data. In Windows, you might see this file level encryption referred to as EFS. That refers to the encrypting file system that is integrated into the Windows operating system. If there are devices that are leaving your building and you're concerned that someone might have access to the storage drives on those systems, you might want to enable full disk encryption, or FDE. This will encrypt everything on that storage volume, including the operating system and the user files. In Windows, you can enable this with BitLocker. Mac OS uses FileVault, and there's other technologies available for almost any operating system. Some applications don't assume that file system or full disk encryption is even in place and will encrypt data itself inside of the application. This ensures that regardless of the type of encryption being used, the application data will always be protected. In order to identify these security events, it's important to have constant monitoring and be able to log all of the information that's occurring on your network. Monitoring can be done using technologies built into switches, routers, and other devices. Or you might have a separate sensor that sits external to those devices. Many security devices will include this type of monitoring. So if you're running a firewall or intrusion prevention system or an operating system where authentication is occurring, all of this log information is stored automatically in the operating system. Many times, these logs are spread across many different systems. So it can be useful to have all of those log files consolidated back to one central source. Very often, we use a SIM, or Security Information and Event Manager, to consolidate all of those logs and provide a central source for creating reports and monitoring data. If you look around at the rights and permissions assigned to users in your company, you may find that there are very few of them with administrative access. That's because most organizations use the best practice of least privilege. This means that the rights and permissions assigned to a user are limited to the specific job role for that individual. They don't need additional rights and permissions if their job doesn't require them to have those permissions. The best case scenario would be that no user runs with administrative permissions. If you need additional rights, you can elevate permissions temporarily and then bring those rights back down to normal permissions when you're done. If malicious software or an attack occurred on that particular user's account, the access would be limited to only what that user can see. This can limit the scope of an attack or a data breach, and it could be a significant difference between an attacker gaining access to a little bit of data and all of the company's data. Another good idea is to enforce the configuration of the systems that are connecting to your network. We would commonly do this during a login process and perform a posture assessment. This checks your system to see if you're running the latest version of the operating system, if you've installed the latest patches, if your antivirus is up to date, and checks for other security features as well. 
This might check to see if you're running the latest version of an operating system, including all of the most recent patches. This might also check for the EDR, or Endpoint Detection and Response version. Make sure you're up to date with the latest signatures. This might check to see if your local firewall and EDR are configured and turned on properly. And it might even check for a certificate to see if your system that's connecting is really one that is trusted by the organization. If any of those settings are not up to date with the configuration that's expected, your system may be quarantined or set into a private VLAN where you can make changes to bring it up to date with the latest configurations. Once those changes are made, you can try logging in again, have the posture assessment complete, and if everything is working properly, you would now have access to the network. When we are past the usable lifetime of a piece of equipment, we often put it in the corner or forget about using it at all. But there may be sensitive information on that device that we need to remove before completing the decommissioning process. This is often associated with a storage drive. So if you have an SSD, a hard drive, a USB drive, or any other storage device, you may want to remove that or delete all information from that storage drive before decommissioning this equipment. If this decommissioned device has an SSD and you want to use that SSD for another system within your own organization, you can simply move that from one system to another. You may need to format that drive before moving it into another system, but at least you can recycle some of those storage drives. If that storage drive is no longer needed and you feel there might be sensitive information still on that drive, it might be a better idea to simply destroy the drive itself, which would certainly prevent anyone from gaining access to that data.